Thank you. Well, with this talk, you'll think um, we were in collusion this morning. That was beautiful. Thank you. Just beautiful. A life of courage. Most of us would probably agree with this definition of courage. The confidence to act in accordance with our own belief. The confidence to act in accordance with our own belief. Courage was a big topic these past five weeks in the class I was doing on the Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. Oh, we had good discussions. It was a really great class. It was really great. And I wanted to share, who was in that class? There was somebody out here who was in that class. Oh, of course, of course. We had, I don't know, if you like to really get into deep discussions, oh, it was fun, it was fun. So I wanted to share some of the key points because Don Miguel might say a life of courage, but he would probably say live a life of courage. Live it, just don't think about it. In the first chapter, he talks about the agreements that we make. Now, the agreements are our beliefs that we've made with ourselves about how we think things should be. And he invites us to question where our beliefs come from. Many agreements came from our parents or our teachers or our friends or maybe watching TV. And as a child, we may have noticed that we got rewarded when we were good. And if that continued very long, we would have a belief that if we were really good, we would get a reward. That's what he calls domestication. <laughs> I know you think of domesticated cows or horses, but no, this is domesticating human beings. And uh, we become domesticated when we set our beliefs like, I'm too short, I'm too tall, I'm too fat, I'm too thin, or things that we're really good at. I'm really good at singing or dancing or or whatever it is, we set those beliefs. And you know, over the years, we kind of forget what those beliefs are as solid beliefs. But every once in a while, something will happen and they pop up and we go, oh, I forgot I believed that. I forgot. So in our domestication, we can also find ourselves being what other people expect us to be. in order to receive rewards like friendship, love, acknowledgement. And so it's our reactions to things that give an indication of what our belief might be because something happens and we thought, well, where's, our, where's my reward? I was good. Do we feel less than? Do we feel unworthy? Do we feel rejected? Those are indications that we have a belief that isn't serving us very well. Think about it, if we react out of fear, if we react, if we act out of fear, uh, fearing being rejected, our real self kind of withers away. We kind of forget who we are. I remember after my divorce when I moved from Puget Sound down to Reading, and I built a home. It was so exciting because I'd never been an owner of a home and I wanted to do that. And then all the questions came. What color carpet do you want? What color wallpaper do you want? What color paint do you want? And I went, I don't even know what color I like. And it was a real realization for me because all my likes and dislikes were my husband's likes and dislikes. We were quite a pair. We were quite a pair. I really wasn't there. I was just a copy of what he was. So I started to wonder, who am I really? I mean, really, I can't even pick a color for a carpet, for heaven's sakes. Well, I mentioned this probably some time ago, but it was at that time that I was in a place where I met people from this center, and they were telling me about it. And I thought, well, I'll come and check it out. And Dr. Andrea was having a class called something like Rediscovering the Real Me. Uh, oh, I need to take that class. And then I got really scared. What if I flunk this class? <laughs> honest, honest. What if I can't find out? What if there is no real me? All these things went through my mind, oh my God. And at the end of the class, I was shocked when she said, don't you know your true calling? I went, I barely learned my colors. And she <laughs> said, your, your true calling is to be a teacher. And I went, what? What is that? 
And so I got, went through practitioner training, et cetera, to become a teacher here. And I just dearly love it. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. So if you've ever uh, taken an inventory to see where in your life you're living it based on other people's expectations of you, it's a good thing to do. It might be a good thing for the new year. Because all those beliefs are in subconscious mind. We don't always notice them, but they'll pop out at the most incredible time. You know, perhaps uh, you know a child whose parent was afraid of water, afraid of swimming, and they wouldn't let them swim, or afraid of them going on a boat, and they passed this fear to the child, and the child accepted it and uh, believed it to be real, that water was dangerous. So if you don't understand where our fear came from, it's really good to check it out because we might have just latched onto it and it really wasn't the truth. That's what ministers and practitioners do for you. They will help you. They will help you with that. Anytime we have a fear that moves us away from our relationship with God, it's a good thing to talk to a practitioner or a minister. We don't want to be separated from the source. You know, fear can be an amazing controller, and the ego can grab onto that and say, don't change. People may not like you. <laughs> People may not like the new you, the real you that comes out of this. But do we really want to keep being who we aren't? And how long are we going to do that? And it may not be all of us. It may be just a part of us. It may be just a part. Well, Don Miguel says we judge ourselves very harshly because we cannot forgive ourselves for not being who we think we should be. Now, that's complicated. We judge ourselves harshly because we're not being who we think we should be. I see a couple heads nodding. <laughs> we can't forgive ourselves for not being perfect, whatever that is whatever that is. Then we judge others for not being perfect. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> Everybody falls short of expectations, don't they, in that kind of a, a thought process. But he says, in the end, we abuse ourselves more than anybody else. We do it. In a relationship, here's an interesting point he makes in this book. You know, you read through this book and you go, okay, okay, four agreements. And then you sit down and you read every line and there's these gems in there that just jump out at you. He said, in a relationship, if someone abuses us a little less than we abuse ourselves, we'll probably stay in that relationship forever. You heard that. We'll probably stay in that relationship and tolerate that abuse. Why? We think we deserve it. It's how we treat ourselves, only not that bad. It's interesting. Some families, I know in Ohio, um, I don't know what it is about some families, but they love criticizing each other. And it's fun, and everybody laughs, and then so it gets to be not fun. It gets to be hurtful. But you get into this thing of criticizing, criticizing, criticizing. And the question is, when you fall in love with somebody else, you start throwing out some criticisms to see how they're going to take it. They will take it at the level they will tolerate abuse from other people. So this dance begins. They think, I deserve it. But you know what? We don't deserve that. We don't. It's time to take an inventory. It's time to change that belief. It's time to get the willpower and the courage to step up Ask for help if you need to. Read the book if you need to, whatever. You do not deserve that. <laughs> I always get a kick out of uh, standing in line at Safeway and look at all these magazines of these beautiful people. I'm never going to be that. <laughs> but it's easy to see, oh, that's perfection. You know, look around the store and you go, not much perfection here. <laughs> huh? Photoshop. <laughs> and so if we're comparing ourselves with these models on these magazines, 
we're not accepting ourselves, we're judging ourselves, we're bring, being really harsh on ourselves. And w then when somebody says, oh, you don't look too bad, you go, okay. <laughs> it's amazing what a tangled web we weave of, of beliefs and, and listening to other people's opinions of us. So Don Miguel says two words, stop it. I love that. Find the courage. Change those beliefs. Fill them in with beautiful things. Fill them in with wonderful things. Reclaim your personal power. I think in life right now, it's about time to do that. <laughs> he says it's going to take a strong will and a lot of courage. It's time to live your personal dream of heaven here on earth. And that's just the introduction to this book. Can you imagine? Now we're going to get to the agreements. <laughs> All these gems in the introduction. Oh, So you probably know the first agreement, be impeccable with your word. Now here we know our words are energy. Our words are an energy, a force. It's like little packets of energy going forth from us. Your word is also your intent. And your intent manifests things in your life. Your intent is like, a magnet pulling other energy into your life. So your word can either make life, heaven, or hell. We don't always think of it that way when we're using our words. <laughs> but he says the misuse of our words is black magic. Now he comes from the Toltec tradition in Mexico, so I wasn't too alarmed at that, were those words black magic, but black magic, but he said it's like casting spells. That's what our words do, they cast spells. You know, I know some people who, when they were children, someone told them, oh, you are not good at art. And they carried that through to adulthood. Asked them to design a poster, oh, I'm not good at art. It's just in there, and it pops out. It, we get hooked on these things, and we cement them in subconscious mind. And that's why an inventory is so important. So being impeccable with your word. The root word of impeccable in Latin means without sin. I thought, oh, wait a minute, where, where did that come in with being impeccable with your word? Be without sin. In the Toltec tradition, sin means doing things against ourselves. All right, now I get it. Doing things against ourselves, such as blaming and judging. He said self-rejection is the biggest sin that you commit. So to be impeccable with your word says do not use your word against yourself. Don't blame yourself or others. You know, I remember growing up strict Catholic, and I love the Catholic religion. I'm so glad my mom made me do that. I'm, it made me the wonderful person I am today. But, <laughs> but the rules were really strict, and I, I guess I, that was good for me. But they labeled things as sins, venial sins and mortal sins. Every once in a while, the nuns would march us over to the church, and the priest would be in the confessional box, and we'd have to go in and confess our sins. And I got really good at that. I told two lies and disobeyed my parents twice. That always went over well. <laughs> the priest would listen, bless his heart. He says, yeah, I know who she is. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> And he would say, your penance is to go in the church and do three Our Fathers, three Hail Marys, and three Glory Bees prayers. So I'd go in and rattle those off and feel pretty good about myself. Now, if you never went to a priest to get forgiveness, that venial sin, those venial sins, disobeying your parents is a big venial sin, would stay on your record, your soul's record, until you die. <laughs> Honest. And then each one of those would be 150 days in purgatory. Now, as I'm getting up in high school, I'm counting all these up, you know. <laughs> when was the last time I went to confession and got forgiveness? Holy cow, hope I don't die soon. But, <laughs> but a mortal sin, here's what they say about a mortal sin, something so heinous that it deprives our soul of grace and causes damnation if it's unforgiven at the time of our death. That should scare anybody to death. <laughs> I'm glad I never had to ask for forgiveness of a mortal sin, which is typically murder, abortion, all these different things. 
but uh, I'd still be kneeling there, I, I think, if, if I had a mortal sin. So here's where Don Miguel surprises me. He says, self-rejection is a mortal sin. What? Self-rejection is a mortal sin. The worst of the worst. You know, after doing this class, I agree with him. Here in Centers for Spiritual Living, we teach the Science of Mind text, and we have principles and beliefs that we teach. One of these principles is oneness. There's one infinite intelligence, one source, one being, which creates everything out of itself. That includes us. That's what we call oneness. We are brothers and sisters to each other and everyone in the world. Another principle is goodness. All of creation is the manifest body of God, and it's all inherently good. We live in a life-affirming universe. We are inherently good. Who would want to reject that? Eternal life. Life is eternal. We believe in immortality, that our individual souls go, goes on in this universe forever that our soul lives forever, so why would we reject ourself on this path in eternity? Spiritual beings, we're all spiritual beings living in a spiritual universe. I don't even know what it would feel like to reject that. Freedom, we're free to choose and create our experience. We are free. Don't want to reject that. So why would we reject these truths about ourselves? Lack of awareness. And that's why I think Don Miguel's right, self-rejection is a mortal sin. It's really something to consider. So we come to the second of four agreements. Let's kind of lift us up a little bit here. <laughs> but it comes out of the first. Yeah, he's layered these. The second agreement is don't take anything personally. If we take someone else's opinion personally, we think they're right. Something in us goes, uh-oh, I must be wrong. Something in us believes what they said. Now, Jim in the back last week came to me and he said, I've been watching. He's in the sound team. And he said, you tend to favor one side of the congregation more than the other when you're talking. And I could have taken that really personally because I try to look at all of you, but I don't want to be a bobblehead, <laughs> you know? And so I said, thank you for sharing that. And I, now I'm aware of that. But I didn't, I didn't really feel bad about it because I'm conscious of that. Not that there's more people here than there and I should look. Anyway, you know how it complicated it gets when you take it personally. Oh, does somebody feel offended? Oh, is somebody whining? Is somebody sad I didn't look at? I mean, you know how that goes. Oh, my God. So you just hear somebody's opinion and you go, thank you. And you contemplate it. You look at it. You know, in this class, it was interesting because I used a workbook created by another minister. And I didn't bother to read all the questions that were in the workbook for the students. <laughs> and um, one of my... People in class has gone, uh huh. <laughs> and so the morning of the first class, I'm going through all of it and I'm going, you know, like Matthew McConaughey and Home Alone. Ah, I'm just like, ah, how could that be? I hate to make mistakes like that. And so I made a new question sheet and brought it to class. And I love Sherry Miller. She said, Mary, quit taking it personally. Oh, bless you, child. Bless you. But it's easy to say and sometimes not easy to do. So the third agreement comes out of the first agreement also, and it's don't make assumptions. Oh, boy. The problem with making assumptions is we believe we're correct. <laughs> and we don't ask enough questions because we know we're correct. We know we're right. But we often find ourselves in a misunderstanding. Oh, I assumed you met. 1 p.m. instead of 11 a.m., or I assumed, I assumed, I assumed, and this big drama gets created for nothing. And it sets us up for suffering, especially in relationships, because we've been married 10 years. He ought to know what I like. 
You ought to know what I want. Wait a minute. We've been together all this time. You don't know this? And we suffer. Well, I have to tell you a story. When Paul and I met, and as two souls, as soulmates, oh, came together so quickly and so wonderful, and I moved in with him, and I got up the next morning, and I started cooking bacon and eggs, and he came out and said, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, man. He was shocked that I was making bacon and eggs, and I had never even asked him, do you eat breakfast? I don't know. I don't know. And then the second shock was, how, how in the world would I assume he would like bacon and eggs? A little tension there. I cook bacon and eggs every day for 21 years with a person I was previously married to. <laughs> That's why I assumed men like bacon and eggs. Big. So I'm sitting there and I'm almost whimpering. You know, I'm doing this out of love. It's because I love you. But what about me? What, what about my breakfast? He said, make your own breakfast. Boy, you know, he's, he's always been clear. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I've never liked bacon and eggs for breakfast. I'm sick and tired of bacon and eggs for breakfast. And so I started having protein drinks for breakfast, and he makes his oatmeal, and we're very happy. <laughs> but isn't that interesting? Uh, the shock, initial shock, and then the, wait a minute, do what's right for you. He's always said that, do what's right for you. So it takes courage to stop making these assumptions and ask questions. It makes life a lot easier. <laughs> the fourth agreement. Now the fourth agreement is an action step. It's the way we say after we do our spiritual mind treatment, our affirmative prayer, treat and move your feet. Move your feet. And the fourth agreement is always do your best and it's action, taking action. Yet sometimes we might not have enough energy to do our best. But if we don't have enough energy, we'll just do the best that we can with that level of energy. You know, Emma Curtis Hopkins, who's a, a wonderful lady that Ernest Holmes studied with for a while, she taught everyone is doing their best every minute of every day. May not look like it to us, but it's the best they can do at that moment. And that's where we honor that. That's where we have compassion for people. They're doing the best they can. They really are. Thursday, I took um, several baskets of shoes to Living Hope and 50 scarves and hats knitted by Barbara Bella and her neighbor that she paired together. Oh, my God. I can't even explain the gratitude on people's faces. The gratitude. It was, it was just amazing. And then I took the bears to the police. Oh, it, was, it was a great day. Somebody said, can I go with you? I said, no, I want to feel all this goodness. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, they were so thrilled. They, well, this one's cute. Well, this one's cute. Well, we'll take this one to Mercy. No, let's take it to uh, One Safe Place, the Women's Refuge. Let's, oh, my gosh, it was so sweet. They, they so appreciated that. So you did your best. It was great. 92 bears, by the way. Yeah. And Don Miguel says, there's another aspect to this you have to look out for when you're doing more than your best, when you're pushing hard and overdoing it. Thank you, Don Miguel. <laughs> you know, we overdo, we deplete our energy, then we don't have enough energy for maybe the loved ones in our life or for the joyful things that we like to do. <laughs> Just as re recent as the other day, I, I leave at 3.30 to get home at 4 o'clock, which Paul and I have agreed that's his expectation and my acquiescence. Yes, I will do that. It was 3.25, and I, I got five more minutes. What can I do on my desk in five more minutes? Not what could I go and say hi to Lori, or talk to Sylvia in the office. What can I accomplish in five more minutes? So this is what he's talking about. Don't overdo. Take those minutes and give love. Why not? You may know the story of a man who went to a monastery and talked to a a Buddhist master, and he said, if I meditate for four hours a day, how long will it be before I'm enlightened? 
And you know what the master said. Ten years. It's about, Master, if I meditate eight hours a day, how long will it take till I'm enlightened? 20 years. <laughs> Why would it take so long if I meditate more? And this is the point. You're here to be happy and to love and to enjoy this life. If you can do two hours of meditation and feel the best you can, that's all you need to do. If you meditate eight hours, you're going to miss the point. You're going to be tired. You're going to be grumpy. You won't enjoy life. So here's another key point he makes. All these little gems. The first three agreements only work if we do our best. Now, why didn't he put that first? I don't know. Maybe we wouldn't pay attention. I don't know. Um, if we're doing our best, here it is. We'll, we won't misuse our words so much. We won't take things personally. We won't be making as many assumptions. Because if we do, we'll become weaker over time. This is what transformation is all about, and he uses this word a lot, transformation. Become the master of transforma transformation. Root out those negative beliefs. Replace them with something positive and life-affirming. In the end, it's all about awareness. awareness. And the truth is that the world is very beautiful. If you look at Earth from space, what a most gorgeous, beautiful planet we live on. If we have the courage to practice the four agreements, life can be so much easier. Challenging, but easier. And so, as you are an individual spiritual being, living in an intelligent universe, created out of the goodness of God to enjoy freedom on this everlasting journey of the soul, forever and ever expanding, I give you permission today to live a life of courage. And so it is.